The date is the 19th of October, and we will be talking about the Ukrainian attacks that occurred across the Dnieper River and also the Ukrainian attackum strikes that occurred on the Berdyansk and Luhansk airfields, respectively. Let's begin by looking at the chronology of what happened across the Dnieper River, starting off with the night of October 16th and the early morning of October 17th. The first reports of Ukrainian crossing across the river in this specific area to the east of the Antonovsky Bridge and across the now destroyed rail bridge is over here. This is the region where the Ukrainian attacks were centered. And the first claims came from Rybar. Rybar claimed that on the night of the 16th, there were four groups from the 35th and 36th Marine Brigades. And the thing that's interesting about this is that the 35th and 36th Marine Brigades, which I'll zoom out and click on, these are two units that were fighting on the Veliko Novosilka axis throughout the counteroffensive for many, many months. And about a month and a half ago, or maybe even more than that now, they were moved out, basically following the capture of Oruzhenye. And then we saw them attacking in the direction of Novodonetsk and Novomayorske. And now it's been a few weeks since the Ukrainians launched those attacks towards those two villages, which are located to the east of the Velika Novosilka sector. And now we're beginning to hear information about the movement of both of these Marine Brigades to a totally new part of the front line, specifically to the Kherson front. And a lot of the reports talking about Ukrainian advances, they mention these two units being involved. And so going back to the Rybar claim, what they were saying is that the Ukrainians, they sent four groups from these two brigades across the railway bridge. So they were using boats, speedboats across the Dnieper River, and they landed in an island over here, pretty small island located over here in this box. It's called Oleshkinsky Island. And then from there, they were able to also cross over an additional part of the rail bridge. Obviously, they're not climbing onto the rail bridge itself because in this area, it's already been destroyed. And we'll zoom in to show that. This is the part of the rail bridge that goes above the Konka River. And what you'll see is that the Ukrainian forces initially, at least according to Rybar, and I have to use them because they were the first ones to talk about it. According to Rybar, the Ukrainians were able to cross over this bridge and reach all the way through the floodplains in the direction of two villages. Peace Chanivka, which is located over here, and then a bit further to the southwest over here, the village of Poima. The Rybar claim is that these attacks from the early morning of the 17th were halted by Russian shelling, which was able to injure eight Ukrainian forces and led to the evacuation of the wounded across the Dnieper River. Then the Rybar reports mentioned that the Ukrainians were able to regroup by the afternoon of October 17th, and using the help of artillery and additional reinforcements, they were able to enter the northern outskirts of the village of Pischanivka, and also enter the village of Poima and actually take it over. That was what they reported from October 17th. And the Rybar assessment at the time believed that there was a possibility of the hostilities becoming even larger with even more Ukrainian forces being engaged in the attacks because they mentioned that the 35th and 36th Marine Brigades are a part of what's being called the Katron Strike Group. So there are multiple different Ukrainian tactical groupings that we've noticed around the Kherson front. Going back like three weeks, I had a video about it looking at the Ukrainian Omaha grouping, Ukrainian uh, Thunder grouping. So there's multiple different of these tactical groupings where you have different formations working together under a larger banner, different uh, battalions or brigades in certain cases. And one of them is apparently Katron. Rybar has been one of the sources reporting a lot about these different strike groups. And so apparently there is a larger formation associated with the Marine Brigades, which could be involved in further attacks, according to them. And additionally, the Rybar thought there would be a larger engagement, uh, at least a possibility of it, due to the movement of additional Ukrainian electronic warfare and counter battery radars close to the Dnieper River, which would be needed for further attacks. Meanwhile, Ukrainian sources at least unofficial Ukrainian sources, were able to confirm the movement of the 35th and 36th Brigades and mentioned that before the Ukrainians were able to cross the river, and the video that I'm showing you right now is not from the actual crossing, it's from training for the crossing, so it will be before the attacks. And what they claim is that in preparation for Ukraine crossing over the river in this specific area, the Ukrainians hit Russian artillery, air defense systems, radars, and their fortifications that are adjacent to the coast of the river with their own artillery and FPV drones. And we actually do have several examples of Ukrainian FPV crews that were able to target Russian positions and including artillery. In this case, you could see how a Ukrainian FPV hit Russian uh, D-20 howitzer. 
So this does not have an exact geolocation, but it's from the same front. You could see how there's an FPV operator who's, uh, he has a first person view, first of all, of the direction of the drone. And at the same time, there's another drone that's flying above it that's recording the entire thing. And then at the end of the video, you could see how the other drone is able to get sight of the destruction of the howitzer. And this is not the only example. There's a few ones that are actually geolocated. So I'll go further south and show that. So for instance, over here, if we go to this marker over here, you have the 14th detachment of the SBU. They were able to hit Russian positions near Oleshki with FPV drones. And then there's another instance from the town of Poima. So this is before the Ukrainians were able to enter that village, which I have over here. And it's from the 501st Battalion of the 36th Marine Brigade. And you can see that their FPV is able to hit a UAZ 452 vehicle. So let's just skip to that specific attack. And you can see how the drone is able to actually crash into it. Now we're going to go through several pieces of footage to connect what occurred on the 17th and 18th of October. This first video is geolocated to the bridge, the part of the rail bridge that connects across the Konka River. And you can see here the Russian strikes on Ukrainian, uh, not positions, but Ukrainian troops that are operating generally in this area. In the video, if you were to zoom in, you would be able to see that there is some sort of DRG or maybe just Ukrainian forces that are active in this region. You could see them moving in the background, hiding under the bridge and under the remnants of the structure, but it's very difficult to tell if any of them were actually hit by the Russian shelling in this region. But nonetheless, here you can see that the Russians are actively targeting the Ukrainians. And this is just a microcosm of what occurred that day because we do know that the Russians do actually have a strong artillery component on the Harrison front. We covered more in detail in other videos the sort of units that Russia has. We're actually going to get into that later on in the video. But you can see that it's not just shelling, but it's also airstrikes using Fab 500 and perhaps also fab 1500 bombs in these responses i won't show this one but here you can see russia's eighth artillery regiment striking the ukrainians as they are forced to withdraw from a certain area they're going in the direction of the dnieper river so they're going northwards and they're walking adjacent to the rail bridge and in a certain part of the video they end up having to run back it appears as if they're trying to evacuate one of their members who is wounded so you can see in the video first of all that they're very small groups and that they're trying to stay close to the rail bridge perhaps as a way of seeking cover if there's russian strikes so they could hide under a structure and again you could see that the russians are responding with artillery in this video you could see that there's a small squad of ukrainian forces that are within the motor boats and they're trying to land on the southern bank of the Dnieper river to engage in the attacks but that they're hit by the Russian side, but it's unclear what happened to the actual forces that are located within that boat. And just to go to the last video, we'll see over here that this one was geolocated to the northern parts of Poima. You could see that there is the rail line over here that the Ukraine forces passed. In this video, it's footage that the Russians later released, and it shows that there's at least two Ukraine forces, most likely a part of some sort of DRG or raid activity that were able to advance further south across the Konka River and actually reach into Point by itself. So you could see in the video, there's this individual over here, Ukrainian soldier, entering into the northern outskirts of the village. And then a bit later in the video, there's also a view of another soldier who is over there next to the rail line. In this video, which I could not geolocate, but is generally located in the area to the north of the Dnieper River, you can see that the Russians were able to destroy two and damage one Kras 255 trucks, and these are meant to carry pontoon bridge components. So that would indicate to us, first of all, that the Ukrainians do have these bridge components pretty close to the river, but also that the Russians were aware of them before the attacks by the Ukrainians because the first video of the destruction of one of these trucks came out on the 13th of October, and then another one came out on the 17th of October, which could perhaps mean that the Russians were uh, able to notice this buildup of Ukrainian forces and equipment before the initial attacks on the night of the 16th. And the last part of the chronology as of now came out in the afternoon of October 18th, which is another report from Rybar, where they claimed that 
due to the Russian artillery component, they were able to eventually push back the Ukrainians from their forward positions around Poima and Pishchanivka. And the Ukrainians do still have a presence on Olishkinsky Island and around the areas just to the south of the Dnieper River where the box is located, but that the Russians were able to solidify control further south. I can't confirm that the Ukrainians ever launched a serious attack onto Poima or Pishchanivka in the first place. The reports all came from Rybar about that. And so the Russian repelling of that attack also came from Rybar and doesn't have that much uh, evidence backing it up besides the videos that I showed you of Russian artillery strikes and airstrikes, nothing really on the ground. The only thing we have of Ukrainian forces around Poima are those two soldiers, which again could have been a part of a forward raid. So it's clear that at some point in time, the Ukrainians do want to launch offensive attacks across the river over here into the deeper parts of Kherson Oblast. It's just that there's a big issue with the entire geography in this region in that is that the Ukrainians, in order to land in this region, they have to cross over multiple different rivers, as we saw with the attacks across the Dnieper and Konka. They also have to, across, they have to go across several kilometers, some areas a bit less, but still very large area of just lowland and a lot of swampy land as well, which is very difficult for vehicles to traverse especially in the immediate coast around the Dnieper River, like the areas over here that you see a lot of the greener parts of the coast. These areas are very, very muddy and swampy, especially going into mud season. And there are not many roads in this region for the Ukrainian forces to rely on to launch an attack. You have, for instance, this road over here, which could be used, but there's also the bridges across the Konka River that are damaged over there. So those cannot be used reliably. And there's also a bunch of other local roads in this region. If you go a bit further to the south, operating around Poima and to the east of the city of Oleshki. But even if you look at those ones, a lot of them are not able to support a large volume of vehicles. And some of them are not really in, uh, they're not looking as good now. A lot of them may be damaged by just not being kept up with, not being maintained well. I think this is part of why the Ukrainians wanted to launch previous attacks in the direction of the uh, city or sorry, village of Dachi around the Antonovsky Bridge area and further east around Kozachi Lahari located over here. I think they did these attacks for two different reasons. First of all, it was to gauge whether it would actually be possible to launch a wider breakthrough to gauge the Russian defenses, both in terms of infantry and artillery, to gauge the local geography there for their forces, but also to perhaps create a bridgehead, a bridgehead that they could use on a daily basis to transfer troops and equipment across and rotate it on a regular basis as well. And then whenever the time would come, they'd be able to rely on it to connect multiple different bridges together to launch a more uh, lar a larger attack deeper into Kherson Oblast. So I think those would be the two reasons why. And I think that's also part of why the Ukrainians are launching these initial attacks across the Dnieper River. But we're going to have to wait and see if the Ukrainians decide to commit more forces into this region or if they just continue using smaller groups from those two Marine Brigades. As we talked about in previous videos in regards to the Russian troop concentration on the Kherson Front, the Russian forces in this area are grouped together by the Dnieper Group of Forces. All of them are within that banner. In previous videos, it estimated the size of this force to be around 35,000. I believe I said that about 15,000 were on the front line and that the others were on different layers on the rear. There are supposed to be two layers and then a tertiary layer on the rear. And now, based on additional reporting that I was not aware of at the time of that video, there's another division that the Russians have created in August of 2023 that was meant to be sent to the Dnieper River. I don't know if it's there right now, but the name of that unit is the 70th Motor Rifle Division. Within this division, you have this regiment. You have three motor rifle regiments. You also have one artillery, uh, self-propelled artillery regiment, actually, which is located over here. And then you also have this one tank regiment. So this division was most likely created, 70th Motor Rifle, in order to sort of fill the void of the 70th Air Assault Division, which was moved out of the Harrison Front. And it's one of Russia's better units from the VDV. It was moved to the Orkiv sector in order to prevent Ukrainian breakthroughs in the counteroffensive. So this was meant to be created to fill that void. But it can't do that fully because these are uh, new 
fresher soldiers who don't have the experience, they don't have uh, as much training, they don't have the same sort of equipment. So again, that's the big reason why they removed the Harrison Front, because that's supposed to be the area with the lower intensity of fighting. So they could be moved there and it wouldn't be as big of a deal for the Russian side. But if the Ukrainians are serious about attacking over here, then it could be an issue given the uh, lower quality Russian forces from territorial defense units and also from BARS formations. But the big issue for the Ukrainians is that they're not directly engaging with Russian forces in a lot of these videos. We could see that they're not even able to reach Russian positions in a lot of these instances because they have to go across these open areas, these swampy areas. And by the time they reach the Russian positions, there's already a Russian knowledge of where they're located based on the drones and the artillery. So then it becomes a battle of whether the Ukrainian counter battery fire and their own FPV drones are able to outgun the Russian side in a way that's precise in order to destroy equipment and neuter their superiority in this region. Now, the Ukrainian attacks across the Dnieper River coincided with Ukrainian attack on strikes that occurred on two different airfields. One of them is over here, the Berdyansk airfield. And then further to the north, you have the Luhansk airfield, which is located over here. Now, there's a lot of different reports that came out at the time, but now what we're seeing based on video footage that was released by the Ukrainian side is that there were three different videos of launches. And one of those videos, you could see that three of the attack comes, missiles were fired, another one you could see two, and then in the last one you could see six. So if there is no overlap between those videos, and what I mean is that if one of these videos is showing a uh, the same instance, then there would be overlap. But let's say that they're showing different barrages that were launched. In that case, it would be true that there were 11 attack -um missiles that were fired at these two air bases, respectively. So here you can see the launch of the first six and there's the two other videos that I discussed. But what is very, very interesting is that wreckage from the site at Berdyansk Airport shows that the Ukrainians actually used the oldest iteration of Attackums, which is the M39 Attackums Block 1. And this specific one, it had 950 anti-personnel, anti-material cluster munitions. So those were the submunitions within the Attackums M39 missile. And what we know about the M39 and this is the first one, not the M39A, is that it has a range of 165 kilometers at maximum. It has inertial navigation system, and it doesn't have any sort of GPS guided system. And what we also know is that, according to the New York Times, that the Americans gave Ukraine 20 of these. So if it's true that 11 were fired and they have nine left, but there's always a possibility of the U Americans giving Ukraine more of, of these M39s or perhaps a newer iteration of the attackums. Here we have satellite imagery from September 29th, which shows that at the very least, there are 20 helicopters that Russia had stationed in this area. These helicopters were used for strikes on Ukrainian attacks with infantry and with their armored columns on the southern front throughout the entirety of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. So yesterday we actually got a high resolution satellite image of the situation at the Berdyansk airfield on the 17th of October, I believe, is when this photo was taken. What you can see is that the maximalist position from people who interpreted this image is that nine helicopters were destroyed, and we have the labels for which type it was. You have MI-8s and KA-52s. But what I will say is that there was a debate about this with some people claiming that it was only five destroyed, and the five that were destroyed, I'll go over here. You could see this one, this one, and this one. These are the five that without a shadow of a doubt, everyone that I saw discussing this claimed were destroyed. Then there was claims that these ones were damaged. And you could see that some people believe that these ones were destroyed. So there is still a debate about that. And then there's also claims that this one, even though it shows a scorch mark, may not actually be a helicopter present over there. So it's hard to tell. And another thing that has to be kept in mind is that in the satellite imagery, there's three other, or actually four other helicopters that are not highlighted and are not claimed to be destroyed, and you can't really see any scorch marks next to them, but they're still located on the airfield after the strike, which does raise some questions about whether they were damaged to a certain extent. They weren't destroyed. We can't see any indication that they were destroyed by the strikes, but they are still located on the airfield, while 
many of the other 20 uh, or many of the other that survived out of that 20 initial batch that we saw in the satellite imagery from September 29th, they were moved out to safer areas due to the strikes. And then here we have the Luhansk airfield and what we could see over here is that at the very least there were five helicopters that were damaged but based off of this image specifically it is hard to tell whether they were destroyed or the full extent of the damage but those are just some preliminary thoughts preliminary images to get you guys an idea of what actually occurred on the ground over here and so that's all i have for today thank you guys so much for watching and i'll see you guys in the next video goodbye